Today we're going to talk about some soil health practices and low residue crops like sugar beets, dry beans, and sunflowers. We have a great panel today, but let's watch a couple of videos first. So we're going to set the stage. We've got about six and a half minutes of video, so let's show those now. Here we have actually have selected uh, this uh, crystal beet cultivar that has uh, a uh, little bit of upright canopy, upright leaves, so that it is more open between the rows so that cover crop can grow. So that way, if you are selecting a cultivar that is more upright in positions, that can give uh, better biomass, cover crop biomass growth. We need to accommodate cover crop or interseeding so that it does not really interrupt that nitrogen dynamics of sugar beet. So if you are going too early, then it takes out the nitrogen and the sugar beet can really see some nitrogen deficiency and it can hurt your root yield. Cover crop is really great for suppose like take out the nitrogen, excess nitrogen, but we need to also consider that it should not take too much nitrogen so that we are sacrificing the root. For each species, we have some objectives. For winter rye, that why did we pick the winter rye? Because it overwinters and it gives you the protection during the fall for the soil movement. And in spring, it also grows up before you plant a spring plant thing of your main cash crop. So it really protects your soil for both seasons. So that is that really the uh, rationale behind picking up this winter rye. Second, for that, uh, Peas, we just want to add some nitrogen for the next crop. Another thing that we selected that uh, cameline and mustard because it is a brassica family, it gives more diversity in your rotation. And some researchers, they found it protects this sugar. Before beans are planted, usually the fall before, the soils are tilled quite heavily, and then again in the spring. And of all crops, pinto beans seem, at least in this region, seem to be fields where we see a lot of soil erosion. So if nothing else, we have cover there in the fall, and especially in the spring with rye. And this year we thought with uh, all the rain we had starting last August, more rain in September, we had the blizzard in October and a wet spring, late spring. We thought this will be the year where planting green, where we can plant the, the pinto beans right into living rye, should work really well. But that was not the case. We found that we were lacking topsoil moisture at about the time we were planting our dry bean. And so the termination timing was this year important and it appears we need to terminate the rye several weeks before we plant to be assured that we have adequate moisture for establishing the, the pinto bean as well as getting as much yield as possible. Something really important is that when we terminated the rye early, it disappeared. The only residue here is soybean residue from the previous year. But where we, we delayed the termination until planting or after, there's still residue there. And that's part of the reason that it helped with weed management and we've had better moisture in there. So it's a balanced thing. If we had good topsoil moisture at planty time and beyond, we'd, we would like to have the rye growing because of all the benefits with rye. But if we let it go too long, well then we could easily see a decline in, in pinto bean yield. in the Wapitan area where we're looking at how we can integrate cover crops into sunflower production. We have a couple goals that we're trying to achieve. The first is to bring in beneficial insects. So if we choose a cover crop mix where the species flower throughout the growing season, we can attract other beneficials like surfid flies and ladybugs to really control pests in this field and help reduce some of those pressures. The next goal is to control weeds so that we pick our green. We wanna choose species that we can control and not let mother nature choose them for us. So in this field, there is a pre-emerge applied. The sunflower were then seeded on 30 inch row spacing, followed immediately by the seeding of the cover crops. Some of the different cover crops that we chose in this area, we have buckwheat, a field pea that you can see is flowering. We also have oats, crimson clover. Here's some flax that had flowered earlier. We used yellow mustard to flower early in the growing season and draw in beneficial insects. 
Buckwheat is used to help release phosphorus from the soil. We use flax to help with phosphorus release and also to support mycorrhizal fungi. Crimson clover and winter pea to help with nitrogen fixation in the soil. Oats to support mycorrhizal fungi, but then also to include a grass with a fibrous root system into this cover crop mix. This is just one example of a farmer initiated approach to include cover crops into a rotation. At NDSU, we're trying to help this farmer evaluate the system and we'll post findings on the NDSU Soil Health webpage. Ahmed, I apologize we cut off the end of your video, but I'm sure you can uh, fill in the story for us when we get to you. Um, but also I wanna start with, with Brad Brummond, who's joining us. Uh, since you got to meet Greg Endress and also Ahmed Chatterjee in their videos, I wanna make sure we have a chance to introduce Brad. Uh, so first, Brad, I'm really sorry I don't have a video to introduce you. I tried to get to Walsh County, didn't make it this past fall, but I will this year. Um, can you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the work that you and many others are doing in Walsh County with soil health and specifically sugar beets? I'm Brad Drummond, uh, Walsh County Extension agent. I've been here uh, approximately uh, 29 years. Uh, we have a, a soil health group that we started uh, oh boy, about eight years ago. And um, we started out actually with cover crops uh, behind the cereal grains. And that's kind of, we had a lot of success with that. And um, now we've kind of moved into conservation sugar beet. Uh, we have a conservation sugar beet project, which is sponsored by General Mills, which was also one of the sponsors to this show. We're also working on a um, project with Tom Peters on, on strip till uh, sugar beets to, for weed suppression, like like Greg was talking about in his, on his uh, pinto beans and edible beans. Um, we'll be working with uh, Pemina County, Walsh County, Grand Forks County, and I believe Trail County is gonna be involved in this. And we're moving across the river too. There's gonna be some counties across the river that's gonna be doing this also. But um, basically, uh, some of our success in the cover crops in our Save the Five program has kind of, kind of morphed us into the sugar beet and potato worlds. Um, I'm nowhere near an expert. We, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of trying and some things work and some things don't. But um, I can just tell you what we've observed on the ground here. I have no research. Great, thanks, Brad. Let's dive right into the questions. And and Ahmed, I'm going to start with you and uh, and the work that you're doing on interseeding cover crops and sugar beets. And so. Obviously, like Brad was mentioning, there's a progression through this when you start using cover crops in your system, you know, starting with maybe after wheat, but then when you get into some of these more complex systems, you could actually be doing some of this interseeding work. And, and you've done a lot of this work in Ada, um, Ada, Minnesota. And so after three years of research, in, you have complete confidence in this pra practice and for good reason. And what are some of the overall conclusions that take this work forward and kind of scale it up? Interseeding, uh, after doing three years of interseeding, uh, what I can conclude that it has no negative effect on sugar wheat root yield and sugar concentration that I can tell you definitely. Uh, one thing that we need to really consider uh, that, you know, growing season condition really matters for the biomass and the um, cover crop stand. Third one is that uh, you need to interseed uh, cover crop before the sugar wheat canopy closes. That is really a um, consideration that you need to keep in your mind because uh, cover crop cannot grow when that canopy is closed. And the last one is that uh, selection of cover crop species, uh, it really need to match with your objective, why you want to plant cover crops. If you need more biomass or if you want to retain nutrients in your uh, soil, and you, if you want to protect uh, your field from erosion, maybe you will get like that uh, cover crops like uh, a rye and that can overwinter during the uh, after the next year in the springs during the snow melts. So those are the three things or four things that I kind of observed in my last uh, three year trial. I really like how you've you've looked at all different types of cover crops and interseeding, but the ticket, like you're saying, is to get it in before canopy closure so it can actually do something and grow. And and is there you know is there a benefit to having something overwinter in this system? Or do you think that just having something growing during the growing season is, is enough? I think that it is more critical to have something during this uh, overwinter because just you can see outside, it's sunny and they are predicting snow melts during this week. So you can see that you will have a lot of uh, nutrients is going to move out of the field through these tolerance or suppose through the surface flow. Uh, overflow, so there is a chance that you are going to lose some nutrients. It is not only, we are always concerned about nitrogen, but it is not only nitrogen. We can get some phosphorus out of the field through the surface runoff. And I think if you have some residue uh, that is standing and if you have some ground cover to retain that nutrients, 
uh, or water to hold that uh, into the, your field, that would be really great for your next crop. And let's talk a little bit about dry beans now too. And, and this one's for you, Greg. Uh, you mentioned in the video that you thought 2020 was going to be the year. It was going to be the one where this practice is really going to work for planting pinto, green, pinto beans into green rye and with the, because of the wet conditions. And how important is it to monitor the rye when using this practice, especially this year when we've, we're already starting a little bit dry um, going into this, this planting season? It is very important to be monitoring our, our topsoil moisture. And we want to, actually, we love to always be able to plant green, planting the, the cash crop, be it dry bean or soybean into live rye because of the, the benefits. Sort of the top of the list are reduction of soil erosion, a weed suppression, and then you can add many more to the list. But we need to be careful about that because as the rye progresses in the spring, especially with dry bean, where we're planting late May or into June, um, the rye can attain a fair amount of, of growth and take up a lot of moisture that we may need for the, the, the cash crop, in this case, the dry, dryable beans. Um, in dry conditions, topsoil conditions, when we allow the rye to grow too long, we've actually seen yield losses in our, our trials of 25% or more. So it's important. So you guys are busy doing many, many things this time of year. And uh, just don't forget about what the rye is doing out there. That's great because rye is not a plant and forget type of cover crop. You gotta manage it and make sure you're looking in the spring. And I, I would assume, Greg, that it would be this, similar for soybean, right? I mean, if you're planting soybean into rye, you also need to be watching that moisture too? Uh, yes, most certainly. Although with soybean, we typically are planting earlier and there might be a little bit more flexibility. But given the, what we're looking at for the spring, based on our dry weather we've had for months, uh, and we need to be careful about soybean as well. Can I follow up too with a, with a question about rye replacing the soil incorporated herbicide in edibles? And, and is it reasonable to have rye serve that role for the soil, you know, replace that? Or how should this be managed? I think the best strategy and, and what most people are doing that I visit with are, are using both. Um, in our research, we found that we can use rye as a, a very nice suppression um, early in the season for, for weeds. Um, in particular, if we allow to the rye to go until we plant. But we, we can't always count on that. And, and so it's much better if we can use both. Dry beans in general are not very competitive with, with weeds. Um, one reason is because they're, they uh, don't have a full canopy in most cases. And so if you can use both, it gives us another tool to help manage weeds. And so I think that's the way to go. And that's what most people are doing. And if we do that right, if we utilize rye as well as with a soil applied herbicide, when it comes to a timely post-emergence herbicide application, well then we should be in the driver's seat because we would expect we'll have less weeds, the weeds will be small and the, the weed growth be uniform. So that's a perfect scenario for uh, being as effective as we can with post-applied herbicide application. Stacking tools. I mean, that's the name of the game here, whether it's soil health or, or managing your agronomic system. So, um, so Amit, we'll come back to you with, with some of the, you know, these kind of climatic conditions and how it influences your practices. And you had great conditions in 2020 for interseeding uh, your cover crops into sugar beets, but you've also had a timing uh, you, you've also looked at timing in your research because of moisture and when you get it is important. So uh, what's been the most consistent over the past three years in your work as far as timing of interseeding? And has that varied by the cover crop species you interseed or is it pretty consistent across all the cover crops? So we planted cover crops, all cover crops at the same time. And as you know that I have 22 inch row spacing so that row spacing matters. So if you have 30 inch row spacing, probably you can go a little bit late, but for 22 inch row spacing, I prefer that I will have this interseeding done by third or fourth week of June, not after fourth week of June, because then you are going to reach to the canopy curve. Now, the thing is that, you know, sugar beet is also, you need to apply some uh, Roundup ready kind of, it is, uh, you have to apply these uh, herbicides also. So you cannot go really early out like, before like early June, like first or second week of June. So third or fourth week of June is the, like optimum that I can fine tune over three years. So that is the optimum time that you can go for, for 22 inch row spacing. And if you have really good rainfall during that time, 
it will establish really nicely. These are complex systems, and so it can be can be challenging to manage all these things and make sure you get the timing just right. And and I want to bring sunflowers into the conversation too, because I'm sure there's some people interested um, in that work that we're doing. And, and we played around also with the timing of planting a cover crops uh, with sunflower. We've planted them both at the same time that we planted the sunflowers, you know, coming in with our 30 inch uh, planter and, and putting the sunflowers in at two inches and coming in at about an inch or an inch and a half uh, with the cover crop seed and, and a drill. But it, we've also tried interseeding when the plants are about 10 to 15 inches tall. And, you know, in the year that we did, um, that we did that, we looked at the interseeding versus the planting at the same time. We found that the, the sunflower yields were actually higher when the cover crops were seeded at the same time. Um, so that can be, I think it's because it was a wet uh, spring and early summer, the cover crop's going to help manage that moisture in that, in that surface soil when those plants were, were germinating. Um, and logistically and equipment wise, it was easier to seed them at the same time for those growers. And we did this study a couple years uh, as far as planting the cover crops at the same time as sunflower. But I, you know, I, th I think that the, the timing is, is kind of what fits with your system logistically and how you can do it. But if you want success, you need to be going at these times that, uh, that Amit's saying, and then also um, you know, kind of at the same time as a sunflower. But I really would love for you to keep these questions coming. Um, if you could put them in the Q&A, that'd be great so that we can ask your panel these questions. As you can see, I'm flying solo today up here. So uh, if, you, if you don't ask questions, you're gonna get the ones that I asked this panel the whole time. So please ask your questions and, and put them in the chat or if, if that's where you are in the Q&A. Uh, but Brad, I wanna come back to you and you know, you're up north where there's a lot of sugar beets and edibles. And I imagine the timing of practices for your farmers is, is pretty critical. Um, how does that match up for reducing tillage practices or cover crops? Uh, what's reasonable? What's going to be, you know, difficult for, or, you know, for farmers to put in a difficult position if they don't get it done at a specific time, for example, if they don't do their strip till in the fall, um, are they completely out of luck or, you know, how are these practices working uh, for timing up in your area? Well, you know, we have, we, we have the tale of two growing seasons. We had, uh, we had, uh, we had two years ago and we had last year. Two years ago, everything pretty much failed because it, we got we got 20 some inches of rain and, and we couldn't get our beets out of the field. And when we got them out, it was all rutted up and then it snowed and some of them we didn't get out and it was a mess. Now this year, on the other hand, we have several uh, producers up here that are, that are doing strip till. And to my knowledge, um, and some of them are uh, fairly large operators and they got all their strip till in in, in decent manner. Uh, one of the challenges we had on, on one of our, our conservation beet site was that, that we had enough straw that we had to, in our, in our conservation site, that we had to hit the, the strip till area twice in order to get the, uh, get the, um, the seed bed to the place where our, our, our cooperator was, was comfortable with. So, so I think it all depends. Uh, it all depends on the growing season. You know, I think in a, I think in a typical year we can we can uh, where I think it really works, and we've had some success with this is going pre-pile, and then going in with shirt with uh, rye, because we go with our pre-pile, we catch another couple weeks, which makes all the difference in the world on on some of these uh, some of the chance for the rye to get established and and get hooked in prior to winter. So. Our philosophy as a soil health group has always been going after the low hanging fruit, whether that's right or wrong. We're starting to go after the more problematic type scenarios. I, I would like to see, um, would like to see a bit more diversity within our beet plantings. I would like to see a bit more diversity and maybe some of our covered following beets. But again, that is, that is, that is at the mercy of weather and weather in Eastern Walsh County is, is about as up and down as there is in North Dakota. Uh, it is just the variance is so so earth shaking that I can't describe it unless you've been here. I could see that, and I think you know maybe that's where some of this interseeding and the sugar beets really fits in well for your system, Brad, because it's it's a in season thing versus a post season, and and I agree with you on that. You know, getting those cover crops down on the pre pile areas is is an op is an opportunity, right? I mean, whether you're putting in rye or you're putting in a little barley and some rye to get some some good growth in the fall, um, that's all stuff that can slow down that wind speed as it goes across that field. Um, so I'm, I'm have, you've had pretty good luck with that, Brad, on the, the pre-pile areas and getting yeah, some established. Yeah, we've done a, we've done a little bit of that. And then where we managed to grab moisture on these pre-piles, it, it works fairly well. Uh, but here again is that when we do this with pre-pile, um, some of my growers have time management issues. 
to, to get it done in a timely manner and get out there behind their beets so they can get the maximum maximum growing growth potential on these cover crops. That's always an issue. Manpower for my sugar beet guys that time of year is, is a very extreme shortage, short situation. So I, again, um, we're trying to move forward and hopefully uh, uh, we can uh, take some of Amit's uh, um, cover crop stuff and maybe start working. But you know what? What I, my philosophy has always been, we have to walk before we run. We have to convince we can walk down the street without tripping on our own shoelaces before we lace up the sneakers and start uh, doing the high hurdles. Let's shift gears just a little bit to, to fertility because I think that's something as we're looking at the system we need to consider. Um, and Greg, do you, do you need to add additional fertilizer to, the dry, to your dry beans when planting into a rye cover crop or is that something you've, you've worked, worked on or worried about in the past? Uh, I'll answer simply by saying um, no. We should not need to have additional and applied. And I'll qualify that um, because we've done work looking at incremental N application. And what we found is uh, increased vegetative growth, but it does not translate into um, additional yield. And the primary reason for that is because the additional N just increases the incidence uh, of white mold or sclerotinia. So we have fairly modest N uh, recommendations for dry bean. And so total N, we only need 40 pounds if a person chooses to inoculate the seed with the correct rhizobia bacteria, or only 70 pounds of total N um, if a person chooses not to. And based on a GORE survey, most people do not inoculate dry bean. Uh, for whatever reason, there's a poor relationship between the, the bacteria and dry bean and, and subsequent um, N production by the plant. So we have modest amounts of N that are, are recommended. And the only exceptions to not, to not applying the nitrogen fertilizer would be, one is if your soil test indicates a very low level of, of nitrogen at the start of the season, or on the other extreme, if we have very high yielding environments, such as growing dry beans under irrigation, then um, that might be a scenario where nitrogen would be applied. And then don't forget about phosphorus and zinc. Um, they probably aren't associated with cover crops, but uh, certainly we need to have, uh, have adequate levels of, of phosphorus and the micronutrient zinc to be successful with dry bean production. And you know, we also need to consider fertilizer applications when we're interseeding cover crops into, into sugar beets, Ahmed. Is that something we need to worry about or, or adjust our, you know, how much end the, the cover crop is using and I, the whole system? How do you manage that? I mean, I did not apply any fertilizer, ex extra additional fertilizer for cover crop. And I did not have any kind of uh, negative effect on the cover crop growth or either on the sugar beet growth. One thing that I saw that, um, because you know, if you add too much of nitrogen, you have the chance that you are going to root, means reduce the sugar beet root yield, uh, sorry, root sugar content. And uh, that is going to be a negative effect if you are applying too much of nitrogen fertilizer. The thing is that if you have some cover crop interceding, they can take out some excess nitrogen during the late growth phase. And then what happens that you can see some increase in sugar concentration for the sugar beet. So there is a, some benefit that you don't want to lose because you are getting paid from based on the sugar content, not always on the root yield. Because I uh, think that Southern mean and those crystal sugar, they pay growers based on the recoverable sugar yield. So you have a chance that you can increase some sugar with this cover crop. Are you monitoring the lost nutrients in runoff or in tile water, uh, in particular phosphorus in the in the runoff? I don't have actually tile drains. So they are not means only surface drainage. We don't have tile drains in my uh, plots that I have in at Ada. You know, that farmer, he has no tile line, I means tile plot. Uh, but uh, what I measured that I measured some nitrogen uh, at after the at the harvest. And I did not see any kind of differences in the soil nitrogen at harvest. We are in Walsh County um, looking at a project where we're going to try to measure that here. Uh, we're working with uh, Rita Sven. She's looking at a project to try to get some data on some of this runoff. But we just have to find the proper site. So we are we are considering this up here. That'll be great information to have. I think it's it's you know we talk about nutrient capture with cover crops and and you know being able to measure that off field um, influences is, is a good thing. 
And, you know, I want to come back to you, Greg, with a question we had back in December during the dirt workshop. And it was, you know, are there options for cover crop after dry bean, or is that even a possibility? I think it's a possibility. Uh, to my knowledge, NDSU has not done that work, but we have done it with soybean, and I think we can apply it quite readily. Uh, there's a number of options where we could add cover crops to the end of, of dry beans. Probably the one most logical one would be to to uh, plant cover crops as soon as possible after the dry beans are harvested. And of course, dry beans are typically harvested earlier than soybean. Gee, if we could get the crop off in, in early September, uh, we very likely could have some adequate time for cool season cover crops to grow and, and provide uh, the benefit, whatever your goals indicate they are. So that'd probably be the most, most logical uh, timing and way to plant the cover crops. Um, in soybean, we, we've also looked at at air applying cover crops after the, the beans have lost many of their leaves. And we probably could do that in dry bean, but um, it really depends on a person's harvest system. And then the third thing would be, um, how about right at, at the time of harvest for people that, are, that use conventional methods? So in other words, if you use the picket method, I bet there's some growers out there that have, that have done this. I bet where they go in and uh, cut or, or rod the, the beans and windrow them. At the same time, that would seem like it'd be an opportunity for cover crops to be spread. And, and with the harvest operation, that might help incorporate the seed lightly into the soil. So I'm pushing things a little bit on this one, but I think there are some people out there that maybe uh, have explored that. So the bottom line is that it, it again depends on on uh, a person's goals, but certainly cool season crops would be in order because we're talking about uh, late summer, early fall before we're doing this. And we need to have an adequate time for the, the cover crops to be established, to meet the goals of whatever you have. But at the top of my list would be a protection from soil erosion. Great, thank you, Greg. And you know, Brad, what have, what have you seen? Are there anything, is there anything that you've seen up in your areas, you know, of, of trying some of these practices after edible bean harvest? Yeah, we've we've talked about a few things uh, uh, within our within our group. We've talked about rye or or winter wheat, or even oats or something just to get a just to get especially when we're going in. If we can get on into our into our beans in in, in early September, we've got time to, to to get a significant amount of cover crop ma uh, biomass going. Uh, so I, I believe that 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 would be another. I think what I consider low hanging fruit where we can maybe target some of these, uh, some of these uh, edible bean acres if we get them off early and, and if we get in there with a little winter wheat or rye or something that's easily killed, but it's going to hold that, hold the, the, uh, the soil down. In fact, I think we have um, as much erosion coming off of some of our edible bean fields as we do coming off our beet potato fields. You know, are, are there any, so being up in that area where you've got wheat production pretty prevalent, Brad, are there cover crops that you want people to maybe stay away from with wheat production if they're going in late in the season like that? Or do they need to be cautious with something like cereal rye? I would be, I would be really cautious with winter wheat because of, you know what, I have not personally seen wheat streak mosaic up here, but I've seen it in Mott in Edinger County and we don't want to see it. Uh, and that's a, that's a, that's a virus that, that transfers back and forth. So I, yeah, I do get a little cautious in winter wheat and, and, and some of those things, but uh, yeah, we have to watch our rotation, certainly when we're throwing grass on grass. It's always good advice in these systems to make sure that you're thinking about your current crop and then what, what your next crop is going to be. So for example, you're not going to put something like cereal rye out there on a field in the fall if you're going to go to spring wheat the next year. Uh, those two don't mix and you'll end up with a bunch of a field full of cover crop seeds. So uh, so making sure that you're thinking about not only this year's crop and preventing erosion after harvest, but also next year's crop and, and what could interfere with that. Um, on the same token, looking at things like, like radish in a canola producing area is pretty risky as well because that's a host for club root. So uh, some of these things you just need to kind of keep in mind as you're, as you're moving forward with cover crops. And we do have another question here, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to ask this to yet, but let me read the question and maybe somebody wants to jump on it. Um, how can you overcome the significant soil disruption that comes with sugar beet or potato production? And Amit, you unmuted, so maybe you're, you're willing to talk about this one first. The thing is that, you know, if you are, whenever you are having these cover crops, it has some residues, so it can reduce some erosion loss or it can reduce some uh, 
disturbances whenever you are having beet harvesting, particularly for those clay soils. And for if your objective is that one that you want to reduce the disturbance or if you want to reduce uh, the like uh, soil aggregate loss or uh, during this uh, beet harvest, I would suggest you that you can go for some crop, uh, cover crop that has extensive root system also and above ground biomass also. And uh, during our, like, uh, if you are looking at our video, that you can see that I take out some of those cover crops and I saw they have really nice extensive root system. Maybe they don't have that much of above ground growth. You don't see that one, that, but they have significant amount of below ground root biomass to hold that loose soils uh, that is disturbed during the beet harvest. And did you have any interference, Amit, with, with those interseeded cover crops and your beet harvest? I and mean, you harvested your plots. How did that go? I just have one time I heard some clanking noise whenever, because this for the pea, it is rolling on the ground. So if you have really extensive biomass, so what happens whenever you have this uh, defoliator, they rotates around and sometimes there is some intent, well, like it kind of... Uh, go into that one and that makes a little bit of noise, but it did not really give you any kind of problem that it is jamming your defoliator or something like a big problem during the beet harvest. So it is just like that noise because of it can, uh, uh, whenever it is coming towards this uh, biomass, pea biomass, it may really little bit slow down because of this biomass, but I did not see any kind of disturbance or like problem in my equipment. I think, you know, I think the most effective thing that I've seen up here and they're starting to do it is use the, the corn strips and we and, and, and try to get them. Most of our corn strips are going to run, going to run north south because um, that's the way most of our fields run. But even if you can stop those with that west wind and cut that off on a, on, a, on a potato field, you know, a lot of people don't like 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 uh, like corn strips, but you know what? They stop the soil from moving. They cut down the velocity. There's a lot of good things there. You're going to give up a little bit to, to, to cover your ground. I've got several producers that are doing that now, and they're doing it in, in, on the beans too, the edibles. Can you elaborate on that? What are they doing? Are they just seeding some corn around the border of the field, or, or are no, they putting it in strips throughout? They're, they're, they're using a, a couple strips of corn. Uh, uh, I don't know. It depends upon the grower. Every 20, 20 acres or or 10 acres or however they want to do it, but you're going to get two strips of corn and generally your corn is going to get stunted by some of your herbicides, but it, it, there's going to be enough of it there that's going to stop that wind, catch some snow and, 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 and keep some of the wind velocity and the soil aggregates from tumbling across your fields. And um, particularly when you're looking at some of that lighter ground just west of Park River, they've had some success with that practice. And, and that's one that, that really shouldn't, shouldn't alter much in what you're doing with your potatoes or your, your, your beans. It's just that, that you've just put that extra, extra insurance and that extra cover against those crops. And it, it also, I think, at least along the rows, I've seen it also cut down a little bit on some of the bacterial blight from the, from the, the scarring of the, of the, of the leaves. Uh, maybe that's just me wanting to see that. Kind of a temporary tree row, right? You can get it pretty uh, pretty quickly and have it there. And um, I'm assuming you're not harvesting that corn. You're just kind of letting those stalks stand um, post-harvest. Are you, are you harvesting those strips, Brad? No, I think the deer will do that for us. Um, I don't know of anybody. I've known a few enterprising individuals that would go out there with a pickup and a teenage boy when he gets to the home a little late on a Friday night to, to pick a little corn, but... Uh, Usually not. Is it a single pass or how wide? You're saying two two rows. Is that like two two passes with a planter or, two, no, or literally two rows? No, I'm I'm literally talking about two rows. It, it generally doesn't grow go any wider than two rows. Okay. So um, I, I'm guessing somehow in there they have to work it into their into their planters and and there's part of the hassle factor to it is you got to get them down. You got it in there. Um, I've never seen, I can't say that I've never seen it, but just about all the, the corn I've seen are, are, are two roads. Okay, I like it. I think the and herbicide Amit, issue is more of an issue than the, the planter issue myself. And Amit, you chose one of your cover crops to be actually an upright standing cover crop to have in there to, to do some of this as well, right? I have flax this year actually. And uh, the thing is that uh, why I have flax because uh, so that it can work as a barrier to hold the snow into the in your field so it is not blowing away. 
and it can recharge your groundwater so that I have flax and I really like flax, uh, the idea of including flax because the thing is that it does not really care about your canopy closure because it can grow above your canopy. So you have no problem during the growth. Suppose like for rye and um, camelina, mustard, they sometimes grow below your canopy because even if you are up, I mean, interceding early, uh, so flax in that case, it can go above the economy. So it can be uh, really good for like interceding option. Greg, with, a, with this kind of, you know, this residue, you know, maybe you establish it early on with using rye and planting pintos into rye and laying that rye down to protect the soil or how long can you expect these cover crops on the front end of pinto beans and that residue to last? You know, will will be there after harvest and still protecting that soil some? Well, there's a number of variables, Abby, and of course it'd be the, the planting rate that was used and um, how well the rye was actually established. And then and then the termination timing is probably one of the, the most important. So when people uh, plant the rye in the fall uh, in anticipating of planting the dry bean or soybean the next year, um, you may want to think about the, the time of planting and certainly the rate. And in my case with the trials that we've conducted, I've increased the rate because one of my objectives was uh, with weed management. And so when you come to the spring and decide on the time to terminate the, the rye, um, the longer we can delay it, the better chance we'll have of that residue being present further into the, the growing season, which should be good in most cases. And I suppose when you think about all these low residue crops in rotation, I mean, we are including other cash crops in there that do build residue. And so, so Brad, you know, maybe we'll come back to you for, for a question on, you know, with, with wheat, you know, wheat in rotation, can you build some of that residue with wheat to kind of help protect the soil through the other parts of the rotation? Or is, is, does that, do you see that typically, you know, that residue being decomposed and not there uh, during the, the following years in, in rotation? Uh, well, what we've certainly seen in, in some of our pre preliminary, and this is just anecdotal and visual, um, on our where we're using no-till in our in our in our wheat in our, in our in our off years on our beets, that stuff hangs around a lot longer. Okay, and that that's going to set up. Boy, I don't see a lot of. Um, and there's going to be wheat residue the year after, but much after that, not really. Up here, we get enough rain and we get enough uh, fertility up here that 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 carbon gets broke down and the and it gets dispersed. I have seen corn stalks hang around for a couple, two or three years in fields. But then again, if you're getting that much corn stalks down, sometimes you have planter issues and other issues. So um, wheat, wheat, like unless under that no-till situation I just described, usually I've only seen, Greg can say it too, uh, to, to see if I'm wrong, but my experience is about a year. So you might get it through the harvest of that crop and, and have a little protection over the winter, but, but much more than that, you're your residue is going to be decomposing on that surface and maybe not as as protective. Um, you know, we have about 10 minutes, well, eight minutes left now. And so I want to make sure I give each of you an opportunity to say anything that we've that we've missed or forgotten. So uh, let's start with you, Ahmed. Is there anything we missed that you want to make sure that you that you say today? Well, I, for three years of work, what I find out that uh, if you select your cover crop species and planting date wisely based on your system, based on your uh, um, like uh, in your soil you will not get you will not have any problem with this interceding cover crops and that is a step towards achieving towards the sustainability of your soil and improving your soil health that all i can tell you and you will have not to sacrifice any profitability from your beet, beet cultivation and let's go to you greg is there anything that we missed that you want to make sure we cover well maybe i'll just mention again uh... The concern about soil erosion with dry beans and and each year we do have a survey where we ask growers what they're doing across the gamut of dry bean production. One of the questions is uh, what's your, your tillage type and in the 2019 gore survey they indicated about 70 percent of people are still going with conventional tillage. So it certainly gives us opportunity to um, add cover crops or reduce tillage or better yet both help reduce the erosion uh, potential that's so common on our, our dry bean fields. And if there's a need for us to do some work with, with uh, establishing cover crops after dry beans are, are harvested, uh, we certainly would consider that. 
So we'd love to get some ideas for people uh, to um, explore. You know, I, I work with a, a grower who has wheat before his pinto beans, and he doesn't do the fall tillage, but he does a, a vertical tillage or, high, or even a high-speed disc pass in the spring before planting pintos. And and maybe that's a way to go is even just think about, you know, you don't have to go all the way no-till, but just thinking about when your tillage passes and, and how to use it effectively for, for dry beans. Yep, very good point. And how about you, Brad? Is there anything that we missed that you want to make sure we cover? You know, I think that, um, that my, that my take home message here is that is there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that we haven't uh, witnessed yet. And there's a lot of stuff that we haven't done yet. Um, when we're, when we're trying practices up here, at least with our soil health group, we try to do them on smaller acreages, like 40 acres or something we can afford losses on. I, I would, I, I think maybe that, you know, maybe our next, or maybe, maybe our next project is in, we're looking at including some of the edible beans in our, in our conservation beet project also. So maybe we'll get some data out of that, but I would kind of like to do some of that with those, with our pinot beans and, and play around with our pinot beans after harvest and see what it actually is working. Uh, but again, sometimes in order to get some of these things done, we have to buy off some of the risk. And I think that's where we've been so successful as a group. We have found money to buy off risk for producers to actually try some of our silly, crazy ideas in fields. I like that idea of trying on small acres first, because if, if you, if you, the risk on small acres is, is better than, than the risk on a lot of acres. So. Uh, so as you're trying these practices, do them on small acres, maybe edges of fields, ways that you can, um, you know, not take it whole field. And, and certainly that's the case of the sunflower work that we've been doing, you know, and, and putting those cover crops in there with the sunflowers. We didn't do that whole field. We tried it in strips across a field where we had cover crop, no cover crop, and we replicated it. And we did a couple different mixes to see what we liked. And, and even now, uh, we found that there's no significant difference in yield by having that cover crop with the sunflowers but there was a 200 pound difference. Now it wasn't significant. So that means the variability across that field was, was, was great enough that that 200 pound difference was, there wasn't enough confidence to say it was different. But for that grower we were working with that 200 pounds does mean something to him. So he may never take that practice whole field. He might just use it on the borders of his fields to bring in the beneficial insects, or he may just see the cover crops on the low parts of the field to help manage moisture. Um, he certainly doesn't have to take it to the whole field. He could do it on parts of the field. So. So I think that's a good lesson when trying these new practices, do it on small parts first, see how it works. Um, if you have rye in the system, make sure that you are watching that rye. Don't just plant it and forget it. Uh, make sure you're watching it for moisture usage um, and just try some different things. Try to get that erosion to, to, you know, try to reduce your erosion after some of these low residue crops. And so we're, we're just about out of time. So I just, I want to thank our panel to, you know, thank you, Amit, Greg, and Brad for being here and sharing your expertise. It's uh, it's certainly helpful to hear the research being done and then also the, the observations that you've, that you've had in the field and in driving around. So, um, so thank you for that. And in this next segment, which is sponsored by General Mills, we have Dan here, who's an agronomist with American Crystal Sugar, and he's gonna share some ideas on soil health and, um, and hopefully give some insight from an agronomist point of view into these practices. So Dan, can you start by introducing yourself? Dan Vogley, I work with American Crystal uh, Sugar Company. I'm an agronomist here in Walsh County. I've been here since 2016, so uh, I've seen damaging effects of way too much water, and I've seen where the year has worked out absolutely perfect. This year was pretty good. Um, before that, I worked on ranches, and and I, in a former life, I was an organic inspector even. So I've 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 been a jack of all trades. You know, what are you recommending to to farmers you're working with who are interested in implementing some of these soil health practices? Most guys you're talking about, I, I like to get them to identify their goals that they're working with first, you know, uh, are we, soil health is a real broad general blanket that, that we're throwing over a lot of stuff, but are we worried about wind erosion or are we worried about water, uh, you know, living root on the soil all the time? Uh, that's identify your goals first and and up here mostly it's it's usually wind erosion I, you know when you sit and measure a field in april and and you're not supposed to drive in the field because you might cause the dirt to start blowing up here in walsh county uh that can get to be a, a little bit of a problem you're you're working with all parts of the rotation i'm assuming dan that you've got you know there are plenty of opportunities within those rotations up there maybe to build soil health or to to look at this 
these practices in a different way? Sugar beets are kind of the nuclear bomb in the in uh, soil health rotation. There's more dirt gets moved in just harvesting sugar beets than in most of the vertical tillages passes that you do. So it's all about building up and getting ready to harvest sugar beets and and uh, and then being able to stop the hemorrhaging after you're done uh, and get back to a, a good rotation or a, a soil health rotation after that. So, uh, I mean, we're fighting an uphill battle. Some of our rotations are potatoes, sugar beets, and then they go into edible beans. I mean, that's wow. uh, that's a, a kind of a rough situation. It pays good though, so that's why we do it. With that system, you know, are there opportunities? Maybe you maybe you're not ready to incorporate a cover crop, but maybe you know, reducing a tillage pass or two. I've I've heard some farmers that, that grow sugar beets. You know, they've got several tillage passes that maybe maybe backing off a tillage pass or figuring out timing on tillage passes might be another approach too. Yeah, a lot of it becomes, uh, I don't like recreational tillage where you don't have enough for the hired man to do, so you just send them out and let them till it. And, and that comes from us being reactive and you know, you never know what the spring will bring. You might not be able to get back into it in the spring. So do all of your work and incorporate when you can. Uh, in sugar beets, uh, Brad had said it earlier, uh, one of the best things that we're seeing is, is uh, we do a thing called pre-pile, which allows us to start harvesting beets earlier. And uh, uh, some guys take whole fields, some guys take 10% uh, of a field and do openings. That is a slam dunk as far as putting in rye or, or something there. You're going to drive it over when you're lifting the, doing the field, uh, but we've had great success with that. Uh, another practice we've done is uh, a guy has spread rye directly into the field, just spread it on. And then uh, when he went through and rotobeated, there was enough moisture from the rotobeated leaves to start that rye growing. And then when he lifted, he dumped the dirt on it and that got to the seed to soil contact. And he did actually okay. And then he was coming into, he let that grow and put uh, edible beans in it the next year. And uh, uh, it was the first time in 50 years that that field hadn't blown. I, I've got pictures of, uh, he did do a vertical tillage pass in the spring and took out about 50% of the rye, which didn't end up hurting anything. And it, he had a great bean crop on it. He's expanding that, but small steps is what, what makes the, is the key for all that. Have you, have you worked with anyone that's tried, um, that they've seeded rye the year before sugar beets and maybe they've, they've left a skip row or something to plant their beets into and then planted their beets into, into rye. Have you worked with anyone that's tried that yet on hope, maybe small acres or? I would love to, I would love to see something like that as a, as an agronomist where we're trying to keep track of the acres that they're planting. Um, it tends to complicate our, our, our business. It takes a field from 150 acres into five or six smaller fields because you have to measure those skip rows out. But I would love to see an eight-way mix or a nine-way mix put in in between fields. It's, it's like that tree row that you can get rid of every year. You know, I, I like that idea. It, it's, uh, uh, we have to break ourselves out of the thought that everything has to look the same and everything has to be uh, one uniform field all the way across. Uh, you know, some of the stuff we spray right over top of it with Roundup and, and some we kill, some comes back. I like the idea of putting flax in. Uh, look, at the, look at the weeds that are currently growing in your beet field. And that is about the species that you should be aiming for as cover crops. And let's just try and control how much that are out there. You know, it, it, it's when we let mother nature take over and fill in the void that she, she gives us the kosher that we can't actually get through, you know. Um, it's, there's a certain amount that we can tolerate without hurting our yield too much. Nice. I, I think that's one of the best benefits of cover crops and interseeding them is whether it's into sugar beets or into corn that that you're you're replacing that space where the stand isn't perfect with something you want to grow, like a cover crop versus something Mother Nature is going to choose for you, some kind of resistant weed that that you don't want to grow. So that seems to be a a great benefit. And you know, Dan, are there any cover crops that you would encourage your growers growers to stay away from that may would maybe would cause disease issues or any other kind of issues with sugar beets? The turnips and the radishes, uh, 
as if you have sugar beets in the rotation and you're putting in a turnip or a radish, there's, uh, there's really no need to put a turnip or a radish into the into a, a cover crop in a rotation. I, uh, I threw the picture of the that beet from the I think it's the Wurnsell Institute, but uh, that's a sugar beet, and you can see by all the roots that it, it goes down eight feet. And we only harvest that the little root part of it. And in the first eight inches, we typically leave uh, about a, a ton of uh, about a ton of carbon or uh, sugar, which is carbon up there. But it opens up all the channels for everything else, so there's no need to do that. Uh, it's disease factors. We got a, every field and every farm is different with their disease factors. I'm a big proponent of concentrating on the best land that you have. And maybe if you have a, a headland that doesn't produce, let's not plant beets there in that headland. I have a lot of guys that put wheat there for the, for the summer and, and that kind of confuses the flies, the root maggot fly up here. That's a good uh, that's one of our major problems in the St. Thomas area. But uh, what about Roundup Ready alfalfa? And you just got to go out and make friends with a with a rancher that needs the alfalfa and and trade beef or something for them. You know, uh, that's that would help with runoff. That would help with wind erosion. Really, we're after revenue per acre. The higher the revenue per acre we can go. So let's not let's look at the planting the good. Uh, producing areas and leave the bad stuff, you know. Brad, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that idea of, of taking those those acres that aren't as productive out and focusing yeah, on the good yeah, ones. We've had a we've had extreme amount of luck with that because a lot of our salts and and a lot of our problems come up from excess water that hit those those county roads and they stop. And as longer that water stops, the more of the salt you get creeping back into the fields. But if you're going to do, if you're going to do those um, those buffer or barrier um, perennials like alfalfa, and, and and we're doing a lot of them, you have to back it off enough to where the water doesn't go underneath the barrier. And I I write I'm not I can't write say what that is right now. I'd have to look that up. But but it's it's more than a drill roll length, okay? Because guys that just throw out a drill row length for that for that corner, the, the, the salt manages to get around it. You could check with the NRCS and give me a call and I have a chance to look at this, but but it's more than a drill row length or it'll go under it. But but we do that all the time in a, a Pesic area. I see a lot of it. And even even in that Oakwood area, I see some of that. It just makes sense. If you're not growing anything anyway, why not get something you can sell instead of making it a loss leader? Yeah, now you, you and you and Dan are doing quite a bit of collaboration up there on those projects with with General Mills and and Dan, what what should we be looking for this year as far as things that you guys are trying and and what's what should we keep our eyes out for? This year we have our we got the strips in. We put strips into wheat, uh, and uh, we'll have a side by side between conventional and uh, uh, strip till uh, sugar beets. And what we're learning with that is that. Strip till isn't exactly no till. It's just you're just tilling in strips. So you wouldn't plant into a field that you just worked once either. We've had some problems with our strips being established. So we're having to adapt uh, maybe a passive vertical tillage and then letting it green up and putting your strips in and counting that green up as your living root to your cover crop. That would be that's a fantastic way to do it. Uh, we no-tilled wheat into that situation, and the wheat was within two bushels of itself uh, of the test plot. So, I, uh, that's a win for that plot. And the other fields, we have four other sites, and they're being set up in different parts of a rotation right now for sugar beets. And that's that's what we're looking at. And we got stuff cooking with Tom Peterson, T Tom Peters at NDSU about. Uh, uh, maybe a, a theory of trying to control some resistant weeds is not disturbing that soil in between uh, in between so uh, we're working with that uh, it's really right now is just trying to figure out where strip till no till maybe but where strip till works and the biggest benefit is where it doesn't work and don't do it uh, if you're in the bottom of a lake bed in the lowest part of your township, maybe that's not a good field to put strip till into, you know, uh, trying to 
we can't treat everything the same anymore. We have to, each field is individual, each part of a field is individual, and, and we have different goals for every field. I think that's a lot of what we're doing here with Soil Health is trying to identify the, the appropriate practices for the, for the appropriate fields and how we're gonna make those practices work and set ourselves up for success.